This is Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm James Just, and welcome. With me today is Mike Giles and Jason Quintero. Jason, the, yes, recently the Trump administration has revealed that they are going to force hospitals to reveal their discounted prices they give to insurers. For those of you who don't know, insurance companies pay a much lower rate for the exact same service than cash buyers. And so what's your view on this? I'm excited about this, very excited about this. I would like to see some transparency in the pricing. I know that I have paid for some services out of, out of hand or cash, and I have paid through insurance. I've always kind of wondered, what's the difference here? You know, I know I've paid less when I pay cash, so why is the insurance company charging so much more? I want to know. I like the transparency. Uh, yeah, I've been lucky enough at one point in my life to go 33 years without seeing a doctor or going to a hospital or anything, but I finally did have a problem. My girlfriend dragged me into the hospital, and sure enough, they discovered it was just a more or less an allergy, but they wanted me to stay overnight and they kept wanting me to do all these things that cost a lot of money and luckily Kathy just yelled back and said no, no, no. So there's this, I noticed there's this big push for more money um, in a hundred small little ways um, and they were really upset. And then, uh, and then, and I'll be quiet here after this, I took the <laughs> prescription that they gave me to the drugstore, CVS, and they said, oh, gee whiz, you don't need this. We have something on the shelf, half, it cost half this, that'll do just as good. Yeah. And so, you know, there's just all kinds of ways for big pharma, I guess you could call it, yeah. to get more money, more cash. <laughs> yeah, if there's more, uh, you know, more transparency, we can start to follow the money now. Let's yeah. actually follow the money. Who's making the money here? I mean, we talk about the, the military industrial complex, but these industrial complex things actually exist all over the place. The, the healthcare industrial complex, we don't actually know how much a certain procedure costs because, you know, the one insurance company pays one rate, another insurance company pays another rate, and a cash buyer pays a vastly higher rate than both of them. And so where is the real cost? Is it the lowest cost insurance company? Is that somewhere near cost plus reasonable profit? And all the rest of this is just unreasonable profit? Right. You know, I'm, you know, people think libertarians, we all like to big business. This is not true. We like honest business, whether you're big, small, exactly. individual, yeah. you know, honest, ethical, and transparency. And with no transparency, we can, we, there's no way to control the costs. And right. so, you know, in one of the handful of things Trump does right, and this is not actually entirely Trump, but I think in Obamacare, one of the few things Obamacare did that was well was actually made it legal for hospitals to disclose this difference. Now, nobody did. I think Colorado <laughs> mandated that their hospitals do it, but nobody did. And so now Trump is coming by and saying, well, now you're going to have to, you know, assuming it goes through, you're going to have to actually, you're gonna have actually release your, your, your insurance costs. And tell, yeah. tell the people what, you know, what you're paying versus what you know, insurance company A is paying versus what insurance company B is paying versus what you know, Medi-Cal or Medicare is paying. You know, all these have vastly different rates. And no one knows what the actual cost is. Right, and I'm sure the lawyers are going to get involved in the insurance companies. They're going to fight back on this one, right? Oh, yeah. They're going to push back hard on this one. So we'll see if it gets passed through or how long it takes. I hope it does. Yes. So then, I mean, if we were a, a space person that came down, just a dispassionate <laughs> look, you'd wonder who's paying for all these insurance company operatives, their secretaries, their people that are paying the bills. I mean, right. all these people cost money. Right, right. And the money's got to come from somewhere, so it comes from the hospital overcharging or various people overcharging. You know, I so. like what you said, Mike, about you had a, you were staying a few extra nights. They wanted you to stay extra nights. And you weren't wondering why? Your girlfriend told you, let's go. Let's get out of here. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I realized instantly it was going to be like, you know, 1500 bucks a night just to lay there or $2,000 a night or whatever the price was. I don't remember. Right. So what the heck? I can't afford this. And so uh, it, it's just, uh, I mean, there's big, I call it, there's a big pharma we all know about, and then there's big hospital, which we visited, Kathy and I. And there's also big doctor. I mean, I remember reading about this um, World War II doctor that was saving soldiers' lives. You know, they'd been shot. And he came back to the United States and was working and helping people. Mm -hmm out in the country or wherever it was, and they arrested him because he wasn't a doctor. <laughs> he, he didn't have his doctor degree. <laughs> he didn't have the paper, right? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. but he was helping people. <laughs> so, 
So maybe we don't need a lot of this stuff. Excuse me for talking too much. No, you're good, Mike. You're good. These are interesting stories because yeah. you know there's some perspectives we all don't hear. We you know we hear a lot of the the politicians and they talk about generic stories and they, they claim that they care about people, but you know until we actually hear stories from individual people about their experiences through these things and how and how we can how we can actually navigate help the government can help or the society can help or how it's all hurts us navigating you know uh -huh. what we need is transparency because transparency allows us to make better decisions we can't make proper decisions if we don't have the right information if, if we're if we're sitting here going how much does this procedure cost and we don't know mm -hmm. how are we supposed to make a decision okay is that procedure good or do I wait two months and go through the physical therapy and maybe that's a way to do it we can't make these kind of rational decisions if we don't have the actual information in front of us right. and so it's you know for me it's anything that gives us transparency and is going to help us mm -hmm. I agree so about transparency um, there's been a, there was a recent article in Reason Magazine about asking a question: Would a bigger legislature mean a smaller government for California? You know, would you know would a, having more legislatures, more senators, more representatives actually make the government more responsive and less oppressive? Yeah, that's uh, certainly something to think about because you know California probably had one fifth as many people back in 1932. Let's just say than it does now, maybe one seventh or something. The legislature was probably already built and then the people get bigger but the legislature stays the same size. So each person that's a legislator is got a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger crowd to deal with so they can care less. They don't have time to care about everybody. So if there was 10 more or something, mm -hmm. or even just five more <laughs> per district or whatever, there'd be a lot more chance to interact. That's just a thought, a general thought. Okay. Yeah, I, I really don't understand this. Um, would a bigger legislature mean a smaller government? I'm having a hard time with this one. You know, someone has really got to explain <laughs> that to me. How? Well, I, I guess the theory is, is like right now, like my my state senator and my my local legislator they are essentially unresponsive i'm vice chair right. i'm vice chair here in sacramento county and i can't get them to send me a reply email right i represent right. 8500 people and i can't get these guys to send me a reply email and they don't have to care because there's there's 170,000 people in my in the, in the district and he represents and yeah. so if 50,000 of them are his voters he doesn't have to care about the rest of us and so if, I guess the theory is if maybe the, you can get smaller districts, smaller people, you don't have to get, you don't end up with maybe, you know, somebody who's, uh, most of their voters come from a city, and then you, so they can ignore all the people who live in the rural areas. Maybe you can make districts more fair. Yeah, you know, I don't, again, I'm not sure how you actually work this out. But there's an argument that you can get more representation. Now, the other argument is you just end up with more of the same. <laughs> and, and that's what I'm thinking. You know, I, I'm thinking I'm a little more cynical on this, but so you get more legislation, legislators, you get more staff, you get more more people, so you're spending more money to do the job, and so they represent 25,000 instead of 50,000 people. They're still going to ignore you if you're not squeaky. You know, if you're not making yourself heard, they're still going to be able to ignore you. So I, I don't see it getting better. I see a bigger legislature. Uh, spending more money, just making bigger government. Uh, yeah, there's an argument right there because I heard it earlier today, this very day, Sacramento Taxpayers Association meeting, uh, a very knowledgeable person presented what we would probably all call a criminal organization known as the uh, administration of um, Daryl Steinberg, I believe, and how they were posting or putting together presentations which are designed to take in more money and insulate them from any criticism or even response. They wouldn't even have to respond as more money is pulled out of the people. It's a very complicated thing. I can't get into it here, but um, these people, kind of like the Roman Empire, when they get power, they want more and they join with each other to get more. So, 
Well, I, I know here in California, we turn around and they're always talking about, you know, they need more tax money despite the fact that we're having record amounts of tax revenue. And so, you know, is that is that going to do anything for that? I mean, would having more legislatures actually do anything to, you know, to stop this march that we're going towards? towards this? You know, when's enough is enough? You know, we don't know. Right. I think every new... Um a legislator you have, every new politician you have, every new staff, every new program just creates, costs extra, extra money. And we see it in California all the time. We create new programs all the time, but things don't get better. They're not getting better. They get more expensive, they don't <laughs> get better. You're, that's so, good. You know I what like I mean? That. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, and it has to be coming from the spirit and the soul of not only the population, but the legislators. Mm -hmm. And if it's not there, they're just going to go for the cash. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If the ethics, you know, if, if, it, if their voters don't hold them to an ethical standard, it never is going to make a difference. It, it, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, well, as we talk about ethical standards, um, Google has announced uh, a policy to restrict the political advertising worldwide. Essentially what they want to do is they want to prevent micro-targeting, political micro-targeting. Um, they're going to want to essentially, I guess, force everybody to engage in mass marketing rather than, you know, than you know, small targeting. What's your view on this? I'm, I'm not happy about this. I know Google's leanings. I know they're super, super left. We know this for a fact. Uh, as a libertarian, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle here. Um, but for the right-leaning people and voters, they're going to get screwed. Um, they're not going to see what they want to see, or what they need to hear. Um, this bothers me quite a bit, actually. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree 100%. I mean, um, I actually have stopped using Google altogether, and I have no trouble getting information from other sources. And, and so I, I just don't... In fact, I think I... This, this popped into my mind just recently. Today I thought of it. Uh, there was this uh, gigantic professor, I'm just so sorry I forgot his name, one of his names is Roberts, uh, a strong Hillary supporter actually, academia, but he did a big, big, long study and he was able to discover that Google gave Hillary about three million more votes than she would have gotten without Google's aid yeah. to, to move people in her direction. Um, so. But blocking smaller groups like the Libertarian Party from targeting each other and, and trying to connect, that's a, a crime. Yeah, well, well, we talk about this, you know, manipulating elections and manipulating, but isn't that what we're doing? Now, I'm with you. I've essentially stopped using Google. I don't know why anybody would use Google search. They manipulate the search results so much now that you're not getting organic results. And so, you know, that's what you used to go for yeah. Google for, and you're no longer getting that. And so, I, you know, I've gone on to Bing or DuckDuckGo or, yeah. or any of these other services. Yeah. But in terms of, of, you know, we've essentially spent the last, what, couple of years worrying about influencing, outside influencing our elections, but if, if, what we, if our solution to that is to internally influence our elections, I mean, <laughs> haven't they, haven't they, like, the, if the Russians, haven't they won? I mean, if we're sitting here, we're restricting our rights to communicate against ourselves because we're afraid that the Russians might use it against us, but... But you know this. But we're restricting us, our own right. personal freedoms. And so right. I don't care if the Russians want to put their their information out. Let them try. Yeah, right? I mean, it's uh, minor. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a Facebook ad. Go for it. And I'm not going to. You know, a few I'm not going to go with it. Yeah. Well, and it, <laughs> and you know, there are, maybe there's people in America who want to hear Russians' opinion on what we should do. You, you know, we are allowed to have sure. opinions that people don't like, and we are allowed to to discuss and and discover and and. And even up like opinions that, we, as a culture, we don't really like. You're allowed to be a communist in the United States of America. You know, we don't have to like it, but you're allowed. Right. Well, it's funny. I hear people talk <laughs> about the uh, uh, Russian interference and Russian this or Russia affecting our elections. I'm thinking, it's not Russia. It's more Google than Russia. Mm -hmm. It's in your backyard. Google's right here in California. And you worry about the Russians affecting our, our uh, elections? <laughs> It's not yeah. the Russians. It's Google. It's Facebook. Yeah, ab absolutely. I've had so many things blocked by Facebook, or I put it up and it's torn out out of my face, my my site mm -hmm. by Facebook. But um, if Vla uh, Vladimir Putin had nothing to do with that, right? Yeah. 
a, a general <laughs> question to both you guys and to everybody, really. Who, who created political correctness, PC? I, it's been around for centuries in some well, form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly right. But in, the, in that term, that was created by Joseph Stalin. So he would know who to imprison and who to mass murder. Anybody who didn't follow political correctness went to the, whatever it was called. Off to the gulags, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the gulags. <laughs> and so uh, it was, uh, in fact, at a certain point, I'll, this is a little bit sideways, but um, after when he gave a speech, everybody was supposed to stand and clap. You have to, right. And the first person that stopped was hauled off to the gulag. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to sound like North Korea. Yeah, don't no. want to be the first person to stop clapping in no in, in, in the old Soviet Union. No, you do not. Well, how about something a little happier here on this Thanksgiving Day? This, you know, oh, here in a, in New York, a libertarian won a partisan district attorney race. You know, this is an actual race with the you know the L's, the R's, and the D's after his name, and he beat mm -hmm. the the Republican and the and the Democrat. He won by a, a total of 122 votes. But uh, we now have a, a elected libertarian district attorney in Broome County, New York. So very, it is very exciting. Yeah, very that's, exciting. that's great. And he won by 122 votes. 100, it took like nine, it took it took yeah it took weeks. It took a couple months for them to get all the counting done. But it just finally became official yeah. this this week that he won. So it really opens your eyes to every vote counts. Every vote counts. Yeah, no, get, I think that's great. I mean, it's it's exciting. I mean, there needs to be real competition. And once mm -hmm. that happens, then that should help the Democrats and Republicans too be more competitive and more positive. And well, we're not. We're starting to actually win. This is a partisan race, but we've won a big race down in, in what, Riverside County. Was it San Bernardino? San Bernardino County. Yeah, right. I, I forgive. But well, we won a big race down in, in Southern California, and then we've won some other races in across the country. But even those races we aren't winning, we're actually starting to have an impact in, in, in the conversation and in the cities. You know, there was a, a libertarian ran for city council, an at-large city council seat in Philadelphia. He didn't win, but he made a lot of noise, made a, got a lot of uh, um, excitement right. for his campaign, for the views. And so while people weren't quite yet willing to kind of go his way, but they were at least willing to listen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk about Jeff Hewitt, right? Um, well, Jeff Hewitt Jeff, won Jeff Hewitt. here in, Sac in California, but um, in uh, in Pennsylvania, and it was Philadelphia for a city council meeting, not large Philadelphia. Taj, I pronounce his name wrong. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to butcher his name, so I'm not going to do it. You guys can look it up. He was running for city, <laughs> for city council. I just saw him last night, as a matter of fact, and I forget his name already. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's, but you know what I'm talking about. He's, he's, he's very about? exciting. He's, he gets yeah. a lot of people. To, and I'm Maj Tour. There you go. Maj yeah. Tour. Yeah, and he gets a lot of people excited. He's, it's a new voice. It's a kind of mm -hmm. a different perspective. I think he runs Black Guns Matter, I think. Is, Black is Guns where, Matter, yeah. Is where his, his start came from. Right. And I like to say that, you know, people are angry. They're angry about the two-party system. Democrats, Republicans, they're pissed. They're angry. They want some change. And I want to kind of think of it in a different way. Let's get happy. Let's be happy about this. Let's, let's be thankful that we have a third party, a viable third yeah. party now mm -hmm. that Americans can go to, yeah. to vote for. You don't have to vote for one extreme or the other or either party that doesn't suit your needs. If the Libertarian Party is the party that suits your values, vote for them. And now, you get, and now we see that we are effective. We are winning. So go ahead and vote for us. Let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it helps uh, what we used to call a discussion as opposed to just people throwing rocks at each other, right. you know. So uh, the discussion could be the libertarians and then a Democrat would respond and then a Republican would respond and, and it would actually become more adult, I guess you could say, or something uh, in, a, in the long view, I mean, through time. Yeah, it will, our, our habit of having, you know, adamant discussions amongst ourselves, but actually staying, you know, fairly reasonable. You, you don't go to the extremes. You don't, you know, so we have that habit. We have that cultural habit where, you know, we don't, we don't get to, we don't have the freedom to attack other people because we don't have enough of us. You know, we argue amongst ourselves, but we argue in a way that's, you know, I don't want to necessarily say productive, but it's not destructive. It's not always productive, but it's not destructive. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and uh -huh. so, and so, you know, there's some benefit to that. And there's actually some evidence here to show that we're it's starting to make some moves. Uh, the Secretary of State in California published the report for registrations. 
And the statewide Libertarian registration counts up 12%. I think we're at uh, 171,579, it says. And I know here in Cal Sacramento, we've gone to 8,500 after, what, I think it was 79,000, 7,900, you know, seven, eight months ago. If my memory is correct. So it, we've actually started to get an increase here in the last year. So we might be talking 200,000 the way now. Yeah, well, yeah. not by now, but you know, by next year, in 2020, you know, we may be hitting a couple hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, Jason, you're a member of the executive committee, right? And yeah. So, yeah. so what's yeah. your kind of view on this and how, how we gotten here and how we... Well, I mean, we see the numbers growing. And I think that as the executive committee, we are uh, making some statements, we're making some proclamations, we're putting the word out there about who we support. Like, we recently supported the recall of Governor Newsom. You know, we are engaging in mm -hmm. the political dialogue. We're, yes. we're not just we're not just little clubs anymore. We're not we're not just little libertarian clubs sitting in someone's backyard in someone's kitchen anymore. We mm -hmm. are an active group of how many? hundred I should know this, but 171,000. We are an active group. We're not small time anymore. It's not just a social <clears throat> club. We are seriously having serious effects on the politics. Yeah. And, and, and we're getting recognized with this. I have to keep working at it though. Yeah, and then that, that causes um kind of libertarian leaning Republicans and Democrats to kind of join in on the discussion, so to speak. And so it, it, it rounds things out instead of like a, against this business of Republicans, Democrats throwing rocks at each other type of thing, which seems to be <laughs> kind of being encouraged by the media, I think. But regular people would like to have a discussion, I think. Yeah, and I, I'm the chairman for Solano <laughs> County also. And I have found in Solano County, I have friends in neighbors come to me and say, hey, Jason, um, I think I'm a libertarian, too. They may be registered Democrat or Republican. And, and I, know, I know politicians who are Democrat or Republican, mm -hmm. but they come and say, hey, Jason, um, I'm kind of a libertarian at heart, really. I'm like, well, that's good. It's OK. <laughs> it's OK to speak up about it. I'm OK with that. But I see the frustration of people of having to be uh, profiled as a Democrat or Republican where they're not really, they, they don't feel good there. Mm -hmm. but they feel like they have to be there because there's the, the duopoly. And I'm there to say, it's okay. Come on over here and just be rational and kind to people. Mm -hmm. Just try to be that. If you want to be that, come on over to the Libertarian Party. It's okay. Yeah, well, that, that's why I joined because I was a lifelong California Democrat. And I finally just got tired of hating people who I was yeah. supposed to hate and being mad at people who I was supposed to be mad at. And so I, I just faded out, and then I noticed uh, these some really great libertarians locally here, and mm -hmm. they invited me in. <laughs> yeah, the hate is exhausting. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I've been exhausted. I've been, I've been a Democrat and I've Republican. I just got exhausted, man. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of hating people. <laughs> yeah. Now, do we as the libertarian activists have to be careful because a lot of these new people who are going to be joining, they're not going to be the hardcore libertarians. They're not going to be the libertarian philosophies, they're going to be generically libertarian. And, you know, they're going to have their issues where they're not going to be. And, you know, as the libertarian activists, they have a hard time with that sometimes. And, you know, a lot of the party, you know, the party members are full of activists. You know, we're, some of us are trying to change that. Some of us aren't, you know, we're, yeah. I guess technically we're activists, but we're not the, the, the you know, the political activists. It's, there's a difference between this, these hardcore activists of libertarian Democrats or Republicans, it doesn't really matter, the, hard, you know, the hardcore activists versus the, you know, the softer activists, those who, you know, you just, you want to make the world a better place, you want to go forward, but you, you know, whether it's the, you know, extreme or not, but do we have to be careful about how we are approaching this, how we approach these new groups of people who are coming in? Because, you know, do we, we don't want to scare them off, we don't want to say, no, they're just as extreme as those guys, and, and push them back away. Yeah, well, I see some of the hardline libertarians, and don't want to pick on no one in particular, but there are some hardline libertarians who say, I'm libertarian, and you're not libertarian enough. And again, that gets old. We have those types within our own community mm -hmm. who say, you're not good enough. I'm hardcore libertarian and you're not. So therefore, I'm not going to work with you. And we, we need to break that from within also. We need a bigger tent. Yeah. I, be much more accepting of everyone else. I, I agree 100%. <clears throat> I saw kind of a version of that. I went to a Turning Point USA thing at Sac State where they had Dave Rubin come oh, and speak. Yeah. And... Um, he, he spoke more kind of a, from a libertarian point of view <clears throat> and, and wasn't a Democrat or a Republican. He was a recovering Democrat, I think he said. Yeah. Um, 
but it was very mild. And and uh, by the way, Megan um, Maston, I think the president of Turning Point USA over there, was absolutely fantastic and inspirational in her speech. But the kids afterwards, I stayed afterwards, and the college students were just. Um, greatly needing of, of somebody that cared about them because yeah. they, they talked about how their college professors bullied them and threatened them if they didn't yeah. talk PC enough, you know, mm -hmm. and um, they were just leeching to hear somebody that cared and so I stayed as long as we all could stay. You know? oh, sorry, I missed that. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a good, it was very libertarian, although um, I think Turning Point is considered more conservative, but it was a libertarian thing. Um, it was, you can look up Dave Rubin on his site, and I think it's pretty libertarian. I do follow Dave, he's a very libertarian guy. I like him very much. I, I just wish we could get rid of some of the labels. Because mm -hmm. I've been called everything, I've been called all kinds of different labels. It depends on the issue, you know. Mm -hmm. I am all over the map on different issues. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't fit a broad-based, you know, um, thought process. Mm -hmm. You give me an issue, I'll think about that issue and I'll make my own de determination. But I don't have to have a party tell me what to think or what to say. I agree. <laughs> well, on this Thanksgiving evening, let's, uh, we're going to discuss something a little here on, on thankfulness. Um, a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, there was uh, the riot police and protesters squared off in Moscow and the, a young girl sat down between the two and started reading the U.S. Constitution. I mean, it's, as we sit here and we, you know, are we thankful enough for what we actually have? I mean, we, we're able to sit here and have all this wide-ranging discussions. You know, are, are we actually thankful enough for our Constitution and all the sacrifices that our previous generations have had? Yeah, I, I don't think we are. I run to a lot of people who are just, again, constantly angry about uh, the United States, our history, what we've done, what we're doing today. And sometimes I want to stop and say, hey, man, you know where you're at? You're in the one of those softest, most comfortable positions in the history of the world. And you're whining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stop it. I've heard immigrants say the same thing. They're, uh, they're thankful to be here as I am thankful for the good things that have happened to me. So what if some bad things happen? There's good right. things. Yeah. Bad things happen. We work through them. And on this Thanksgiving Day, I want to thank you all for watching. Thank you for coming. You can check out the Libertarian Counterpoint on Pup Access Sacramento. We also have a, a growing Facebook page and a website, uh, libertariancounterpoint.com. So you, please come by, check us out. Thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs>